How do you raise a man? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is take a look at the status of masculinity right now. I think it doesn't take too much of us to realize that the state of masculinity is an absolutely horrible decline. There's very few men left. There is, it's in, in fact, um, effeminacy, which I'm going to be talking about somewhat at length here, is the norm, actually. In fact, to find someone who's not, and find a man who's not effeminate is very rare these days. The upshot of it is, too, is, is that um, we see this in relationship to masculinity in general. Anytime there's any guy that appears on the news media with any semblance of masculinity, he is he, he and his reputation are viciously attacked in a variety of different ways in order to bring him down because they don't want any image of true masculinity to come to the fore. The question, and we're going to answer that question, what does a true man look like? Because I think there's even, you know, some real misunderstanding about how that is or what that is, um, especially in certain cultures where the, what passes for masculinity is in fact effeminacy. So this is something that we want to actually discuss. Adam and Eve at the fall, but I'm not going to talk too much about Eve this time. Usually I'm talking about Eve, but this time I'm going to talk about Adam. When Adam was at the fall, uh, several things ended up happening that resulted in the effects of Adam's sin being passed, not just to all men, not including women as well, but to men specifically. There were certain sins that he committed in the fall the fathers say that Eve committed five and Adam committed eight sins in the fall. Actually, I think there's a lot more there. Um, and the fathers kind of talk about it off and on about, you know, the you know, specific defects in masculinity that you, in, in men, not in masculinity, but in men that you see as a result of the fall. So basically what ends up happening is this. First, what's the definition of effeminacy? A feminacy is defined by St. Thomas Aquinas as an unwillingness to put aside one's pleasure in order to pursue what is arduous or difficult. And then later in the Summa, he defines the sloth. He defines it the same way. Unwillingness to put aside one's complacency is the Latin word pleasure or just being pleased in its comfort in order to pursue what's arduous. Then he asks, well, what's the difference between that and a feminist? And he says, the difference is this. He says, with sloth, the, it's an aversion to what's hard. With a feminacy, it's an attachment to the pleasure. That's the problem with a feminacy, is this disordered attachment to pleasure. And so what ends up happening is, is when Adam falls, what does he do? Well. The five sins that Eve committed, he, Adam also committed those same sins. And one of those sins that he committed was called inept joy. That is, when he looked at the fruit and it was told to him, hey, you're not going to die and you're going to get to no good and evil. He looked at it and he, his lower appetites took delight in the fact, fact that it was pleasing. Now reason knew, because he got the command directly from God, do not eat from the fruit in the tree in the middle of the garden. So that was what he was told. So reason knew... If I'm going to do the right thing, I have to die to myself and just not touch the fruit. Not eat. God even says, don't even touch it, right? So instead, so he takes it, he looks at it, he takes joy in it. He allows the lower appetites to take delight contrary to reason. And then he eats the fruit, which then solidifies the decision. But what happens is, is that what the preternatural gift that, they, that Adam and Eve had before the fall, one of them, was integrity. Where all the lower faculties were perfectly subordinated to reason, what happened was is that the, the, the lower faculties took delight contrary to reason so that when he made the choice to do that, it destroyed the gift of integrity because he chose something in which he followed his lower appetites rather than reason. And so it gave the appetites an independence, a life of their own, right? So he started now, so as a result, he chose that to do that. And so as a result, he ended up pursuing pleasure of the thing, the delight and the pleasure in eating the fruit, etc., over what reason said. So that's where it starts. The second problem was, is, is that when Eve, and this is the problem that women have, one of the problems is, is that Eve eats the fruit, right? Adam shows up. What does she do? She hands the fruit to Adam, which is what? Her trying to take control of Adam. Hey, dude, here, here, eat the fruit. Take, take my lead, is essentially what she was saying. 
And so after the fall, then, that women have a problem with trying to control their husbands. That's the problem they got stuck with. The problem that Adam got stuck with, though, is when Eve handed him the apple, some of the fathers say that he didn't want to be separated from his wife in the fall. So that's one of the reasons he, ch he chose to consume the thing. So in other words, he, again, he chose the pleasures of being around his wife over what God told him he had to be done. And so as a result of that, listening to his wife, my, my line usually is, you listen to her, now you're going to listen to her. All right. But the point is, is that, that he chose that over, that set up a dynamic in 99.9% .9 of men where the wife pretty much rules the roost at home. And he just succumbs to that because he, of his subordination. He just wants the peace. He just wants to live with her in a pleasurable fashion rather than doing what he needs to do in order to lead a rightly ordered life. Then what does he do? Well, now, so to separate himself from his wife was also going to require a certain amount of self-sacrifice. So what he does is then God comes and says, hey, what gives, man? Why you, what's going on here? I mean, obviously I'm paraphrasing. And he says, uh, well, I ate the fruit that, that the woman that you gave to me, right? Two things he did. He was half blaming it on God and half blaming it on, um, on Eve, right? Which meant he did what? Part of being, part of effeminacy is choosing the pleasure of not having to take responsibility for something. This is something that we're going to, we see pandemic right now among most men. So what happens is instead he chooses his, his, him not having to take his beating. Look, you did something wrong. Be a man. Take your beating. Instead of doing that, he blames his wife, right? And then what does she do? She blames uh, the serpent. So what happens is, is him, not, him blaming his wife was another form of effeminacy. This lack of taking responsibility then is another problem that men got stuck with. Okay. So since Adam fell, men have been stuck with this problem of effeminacy. So what are the sources of effeminacy that we're seeing today? This, by effeminacy, I mean in the sense of preferring your pleasure over doing the right thing or doing what's hard and difficult. That is very consistent in most men. You see that very consistently. In fact, it's rare that you actually see a guy who will sacrifice himself for his wife. What's interesting is, though, is there's built into a feminine psychology, and this is what most guys don't understand. If you're effeminate, she'll never respect you, despite the fact that she might have appetitive pleasingness at the fact that she's got you under her control. But she'll never be happy with you. On the other hand, there is designed into women a natural inclination to subordinate themselves to rightly ordered authority in relationship to her husband. So if he does, if he exercises right authority, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. If he does that, she will have a, a strong inclination to want to subordinate to please him. Okay. So today, effeminacy has been a problem throughout history. It ebbs and flows. But today, it's off the charts. It's so bad. It's just, you, I mean, you look at these guys and you just, the, the, the inclination is to, the, the disordered inclination that sometimes one must fight is to want to slap them and man them up a bit, right? Okay. So, but that actually, when I was reflecting, why is it that you, when you see a guy who's really effeminate, you want to just slap him around, wait, you know, man him up a bit? And I thought to myself, it's because we're going to talk about how you conquer that effeminacy. It's contained in that inclination. That is an actual natural inclination. Now, it has to be moderated, of course. Okay. But today, what are the sources of this effeminacy? It's the fact that in our culture, everything is too easy, too simplistic, and too pleasurable for men. That's the problem. So the ease and comfort of life, the fact that there's so few jobs out there now that require hard, difficult work, or that most jobs are just sitting at a desk, you know, plunking away at a computer, practically. So then, of course, there is the problem of technology. There's a philosopher by the name of Vogelin who makes the observation that technology brings us a pleasure in its use. Every time we use technology, we get a certain pleasure out of it. And he says, as a result of that, the virtue that we must employ to subordinate that, to temper that, is temperance. Because if we don't, then the pleasures that come from the use of technology will make people soft. 
basically. Now, what's interesting is in Latin, there's two words for effeminacy, effeminacia, from which we get the English word. And by the way, we're not talking about feminine necessarily. Because you can see these guys, I mean, you even see it in, in you know, like in, with these guys that are in um, uh, professional sports. You know, they'll be on the front line of a football team and they're just grinding it out and beating each other silly. But then when it comes to certain other things, like if you take their iPhone away from them, they're acting like a four year old girl, give it back, give it back. You know, they're not, you're just like, what, what, what happened there? Okay. So the technology, the basically, with technology, especially the new forms of technology which feed a specific kind of effeminacy, and we're going to talk about what those actually are, um, the, there's a, there's, uh, it feeds a specific kind of effeminacy that you're seeing in men today, um, especially in the computer, on, the, on telephones, on um, video games, the TV, the computer, etc. that constant feeding of their, that desire for the pleasure that they get from using technology. And with men, it's worse than women because men are designed for use of tools, right? So the, um, with the use of tools, <coughs> A guy gets a certain pleasure because, because his job is to, to work, right? So, well, work requires tools. And so whenever he has a really good tool, he enjoys it. In fact, I, one of my lines to, to guys is you can never have too many tools, right? Okay, because that's just a man thing, right? They can have a gajillion different tools. It's the same problem with the technology because the technology is just a form of a tool. And what happens is if a guy uses that regularly, it creates a problem. Now, here, here this is one of the signs you see. 50 years ago... If a man reached the age of 18 and was not mature enough to assume the essential obligations of marriage, it was categorically considered to be something wrong with him. Now think about what that means. Most kids, to most men today when they reach the age of 18, aren't even mature enough to know how to tie their shoes. In fact, why is that? Because they haven't spent any of their life doing the things that build masculinity. Instead, what they've been doing is feeding the appetites of pleasure nonstop, day in and day out. They wake up late, which is what? They're sleeping, they're getting the pleasure out of sleeping. Then they get up, they play video games, which is pleasure. Then they'll surf on the internet, then that's pleasure. Then they'll sit there and watch TV, that's pleasure. And then what do they do? They'll go read porn or do something else, and then that's pleasure. I mean, every, every level, the, the boys are just being overstimulated in relationship to pleasure. That's also one of the reasons why this overstimulation in relationship to pleasure on every level in relationship to technology and everything is also why most kids today, not all of them, most boys today don't have any personality whatsoever. You talk and they're like, mm, mm, mm. there's just nothing going on upstairs because it's not that stimulus that comes from the technology, but that pleasure that's constantly there has made them soft. So the first word in Latin is effeminacia. The second word is molitias. Now molitias, for the word for effeminacy, Molitias has three meanings. One is effeminacy. The second one is softness. So when a guy constantly pursues pleasure, it makes him soft, right? And you see this. The guy who pursues pleasure just lays around all the time and becomes physically soft. If he's going to pursue what's hard, then he's, you know, in other words, to do the things that make him physically just look like a, be a real man, just on a physical level, he's going to have to engage in things that are going to be hard. But the third meaning is masturbation. That's what that term means. And so that in the medieval period, the problem of self-abuse, which I can tell you as a confessor is a complete problem, not just among uh, men, but it's also becoming a big problem among women, is that it's such a pandemic of an issue that what's happening is, is that it's, it's feminizing and it's softening them guys, and they don't, they're not man. And this is one of the reasons I tell people, look, part of being a man is being chaste, because chaste is hard. It's not easy, and a real man is chased. Okay, so that being said, there's this constant feeding of them. And, you know, and the music, too, because we get a certain um, aesthetic pleasure out of music. Music's not evil. It's just that we get a certain pleasure out of it, and then the kids are listening to that nonstop. I mean, literally, if you watch your average kid on the street, he's either got something in his ears, or he's working on something, or he's doing It's just nonstop feeding of this appetite for pleasure. All it is going to mean is, is when it comes time to put that pleasure aside, he's not going to have any virtue in order to be able to do that. That's why he can't assume the essential obligations of marriage when he's 18, let alone 35 and 40 now. So, then, Fulton Sheen comes along. And Fulton Sheen says, 
What is the cause of maturity? He says, maturity comes, and this is very true, especially with relationship to men. He says, maturity comes from pain and responsibility, suffering. That's how you mature. And those two things, we're going to talk about that as we kind of go along, those two things are going to be the hinge point upon which masculinity is built. Suffering and responsibility. So that's part of the problem with the technology. Parents put the kids in front of the technology, they let the kid do that all the time, all the time and they don't, the kids don't have any chores because life has gotten so, so simple. By the way, I'm not against the common modern form of life, I'm just saying how we're approaching it is not virtuous. So, and then we don't give them any responsibility through their teen years, then we wonder why we're 18 and we can't, we can't even trust him to take out the garbage. Right, so this is, this is what's happening here. There are four forms of effeminacy. The first is sensual. And by sensual effeminacy, we mean the guy who's just really can't get past pleasures of touch. And that doesn't necessarily mean matters of the sixth and ninth commandment. It can also mean matters of food. He can't put aside, just, he wants to just lay around physically. He doesn't want to do anything that's really hard or arduous or difficult. The minute he's asked, what does he do? He starts complaining and whining like a little brat. Right? Okay. So there's the sensual effeminacy. And that one's pretty common. That's probably the more common one. But one of the things that's occurring now is, um, or I should say it's, it used to be the more common. What's happened is that is now coupled with the next kind, which is appetitive effeminacy. Now, if you were talking about the sensitive appetites of the irascible and the concupiscible appetite, those are the two appetites from which emotions flow. Okay, they're the faculties of the emotions. So what happens is, is, is what's, we're, what we're doing is we, we take little Johnny to school. How did you feel about that Johnny? My tendency is wanted to slap the teacher. Johnny feels great when I slap you. No, okay. So the point is, is what? Is when you get boys and men habituated in following their emotions because of the pleasure that they get from that, you destroy their masculinity. You completely destroy it. Because in the end, what you're going to end up with is a guy who just follows his emotions because they're pleasurable and he, or he doesn't want to fight them rather than doing what's really hard and difficult that is following reason. This is one of the things that's a real danger in our culture right now because that following reason, right reason, as a habitual practice among men is completely being beat out of the men right now. In public schools, in the, cult, in the news media, in every form of media there is, it's just being beat out of them. The guy that's really likable by women is the guy that can sit there and emote. You know, that's the picture they kind of keep portraying. No, he's not. I mean, you take, you, most women who are, have any semblance of virtue can't stand the guy who sits in emotes all the time. In fact, they're just like, man, the guy's like being around a woman. Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Why is it that that's okay for women? Well, it's not exactly okay for women, but here's the thing. The centers of emotion in the women's brain is actually quite a bit larger than ours, the men's. And part of that has to do with the fact that it's necessary for women to be able to emotionally empathize with children in order to direct your psycho psychological life in their earlier years to what is rightly ordered. And for example, this is a common example I give. So a child runs along and he falls down. And he bangs up his knee, right? Now, the man's thing was, pick him up, let's go, we've got to get going. Right? The kid's like, but this hurts. Is it, shouldn't, shouldn't something be going on because this hurts? Right? Well, so in other words, that this is a true evil. And what happens is, is if that's not properly addressed, it actually causes a psychological disorder called disassociation in people's mind, in, the, in children's minds. So whereas with women, when they can empathize with that, yes, that's really bad. You know, I'm really sorry. That, so that, that's, that's proper to women. Right? It's not proper to men to sit around emoting all the time. Now, here, let's be clear. Your emotions are for your children, not for your husband, by the way. It's not there to emote all over your husband, because what's going to happen is you're going to drive him out of his mind if he has any semblance of masculinity. Okay. So, but the problem is, the point is, is that a guy who is trained to constantly follow his emotions or talk about his emotions all the, in all this. Not that he shouldn't have some facility in that regard, but when it gets to the point where he is just, you know, that's all he wants to talk about, you're just like, man, this guy's driving me nuts. In fact, you know, the society I'm trying to start, one of the things I look for is low, I call them low psychological maintenance men. 
In other words, if it's some guy who just needs his emotions fed, I'm like, look, I don't have time for that. Literally. So, so that's appetitive effeminacy. The next one is intellectual effeminacy. And what this is, is this is the pleasure we take in considering certain things. So there are people, in fact, what, there's a college, which I won't name, but there's a college that trains people in a kind of intellectual restlessness, where they spend so much time, and I, I can say this because I went through a great books program, so people can't say, you, you don't understand because you didn't go through one, because I did. But the fact is, is that what happens with these people is, is they, the, and the men, you see it in the men, and you're just like, you know, that's just effeminate. The nature of masculinity is to pursue the truth, arrive at it, and rest in the truth. The desire to want to constantly talk, get, taking the pleasure out of the process and getting to the truth rather than just resting through it, that pleasure in taking in that process, if it's not moderated, then it becomes effeminate and the people become intellectually proud, etc. So this is a sign, if they don't want to rest in the truth, that's one of the signs of intellectual effeminacy. Some, or another one is someone who or tenaciously holds to an intellectual position especially if changing their position requires them to get their act together. So some people have attachments and the pleasure of thinking about certain things in order to maintain their kind of lifestyle, etc. This feminacy is behind why things in the scientific community are getting away with being dogmatized when there's absolutely no intellectual foundation for them whatsoever. And I'm thinking here in terms of evolution, and things of that sort. And you see this. The scientific community is collapsing under the weight of effeminacy, really, in a certain sense, because of the fact that there's no longer a pursuit in truth, and okay, this is the truth. That's just what I have to suffer if that's what the truth is. There's no more of that. It's let's see if we can design a poll or some type of uh, um, study so that we can get the outcome we want. Another one is attachment to one's own ideas or always making one's opinion known. Another way is reading on the internet, curiosity, constantly feeding that desire to know the next thing on the internet. It's addictive if you're not careful. And that's where intellectual um, effeminacy, you start seeing that among men. The problem with intellectual effeminacy is, is that it doesn't give one clarity of judgment. It's analogous to the guy who works very hard and you know lifts weights, etc. He gets a, a certain cut or de definition in his, ma in his physical appearance. The same thing happens in his intellect. If he just is pursuing pleasure in his intellect all the time, his brain is gonna, not brain, but his, his intellect is gonna atrophy and it's not gonna have that clarity and that definition that comes along with thinking clearly. And this is one of the problems we'll have. And that's also one of the problems with, with appetitive uh, effeminacy because when a guy's following his emotions all the time, what ends up happening is, is it starts affecting his judgment of his intellect because he starts thinking things are okay when they're not. And one of the signs of effeminacy, and this is how you can do it. This is one of your tests. If you want to test whether your kid or your husband or somebody is effeminate, take something away from them that they're constantly getting pleasure out of and see what their response is. If they can just say, okay, I'll let loose of it and walk off, well, he's, he's a bit of a man. But I guarantee you most of the time all you're going to do is get someone who's going to blow their lid, which is just effeminate. The last is volitional effeminacy. This is self-will and self-love. The person who just likes doing his own will and likes doing his own thing. Every one of these is against what it means to be a man. Every form of effeminacy, sensual, appetitive, intellectual, and volitional. A real man puts aside his pleasure to pursue great things. Magnanimity is the, net, the technical virtue where you pursue greatness of soul. A feminine man is always pusillanimous, always, in every case, because he's not gonna pursue stuff that makes you great, that causes you to really achieve things. He's, and this achieving great things applies not just material, to his material accomplishments, but above all in virtue. The real man is the man of virtue, why? Part of this has to do with the fact that with virtue comes interior self-discipline and self-control. That interior self-discipline and self-control is the hallmark of masculinity. 
The guy who can stand in the face of evil or pleasure and maintain his interior control is the guy who has, he's a real man, because he can engage things that are hard and arduous and still remain steadfast. Whereas the guy who sees that and then he just wilts, well, the guy's effeminate. Many today, many men today, have not conquered even elementary vices in relationship to temperance. Everything from the Sixth Commandment all the way down to the gluttony. I mean, you see them, they're eating constantly. Right? There's no semblance, of, there's no sense of, I have to get this appetite of mine under control. So there's that problem. And as I mentioned, you know, that the problem with self-abuse and pornography is so off the charts right now. It's just like, you know, there, we got a major issue on our hand. And it's, just, and it's just making men effeminate. Most men don't conquer that until they're much later in life, which is unfortunate. Next is the appetitive. What, so uh, guys who are more emotional than women are, and this has become a major problem even in the traditional movement. You listen to these guys talk, and you're just like, are you ashamed of yourself? Shame is the, is the fear of being perceived as lowly. You're emoting and babbling and carrying on about your wife's behavior like you're a three-year-old boy. You know, you should be manning up and just say, okay, look, um, you know, that's how she acts, or that's how he behaves, or she, tell, she tells me she doesn't want this, or she doesn't want that. Okay, I got to man up and accept it. By the way, I'm not suggesting that you follow your wife's lead. What I'm just saying is, is that most guys don't have, most guys, not most, many men in the traditional movement use, use the authority structure that God put in place as an excuse not to do the things that are required of a man. They make their wives do it. They make their daughters do it even. You know, they'll make their daughters and wives go out and get jobs, or their sons go out and get jobs so they don't have to get a job. Now, I'm not talking about a guy who's struggling and trying to find a job, especially in the current economy. But here we're talking about the man who will use it, or even the guy who t tries to boss his wife around and get her subordinated to her so that she does whatever he wants. That itself is effeminate because you're not controlling yourself. One of the signs of lack of interior self-control is the fact that you, you want to control everything outside of you because, why? If you don't, then the interior self, that lack of interior self-control is going to cause you pain. So what do you do? You try and control everything around from you outside. And that's why I tell guys, look, if you have to control your wife, that is effeminate too. It's a sign you can't stand on your own. You're trying to impose your will because there's some insecurity interiorly, which again is a form of lack of masculinity. <coughs> Then there's intellectual. True manhood submits to the truth regardless of how hard it is. When I went through the, um, when I first started studying philosophy, one of the principles that just stuck in my mind was you have to be willing, and this is part of just intellectual humility, you have to be willing to pursue the truth wherever it leads regardless of the personal cost to you. Because if you don't have the truth, then it's already costing you. And if you come across the truth, then you at least have something, even if it means you have to give up a whole lot of, a whole lot of things. But you have to be willing to follow the truth. And a lot of times that's hard. You see that even with most men today. And you see it, you know, the Congress, you know, somebody will do something, and then the Congress, they, they, you know, throw their fit. And then, of course, the news media beats them up, and then they say, okay, you know. So there's no stick to it of the, what, what is actually true or not. Then, there's volitional. The very nature of masculinity is self-sacrifice. St. Thomas says that the, the, the one thing that God wants from every rational creature, whether it's angelic or whether it's uh, human, is the sacrificing of their will to his. Why is self-sacrifice integral to being a man, more so even in a certain sense than a woman. Women have to do their sacrificing, but in a different way. It's for this reason. God assigned it that way. First, he created man in a way to engage things that are hard and difficult, and to do that requires you to deny how you feel in order to achieve this. Second, he, when he, Adam fell, because he took the effeminate route, God said, oh no, you don't. He said, now you're going to work 
by the sweat of your brow, so it's going to be hard, you're going to be sweating. So interiorly, you're going to have to really muster the energy to do this, which requires self-denial and self-sacrifice. And two, it will be in thorns. It's going to be painful for you to do this. Okay. So God basically then said, oh, and by the way, blaming Eve, not good enough. Guess what? Now you have to support her. So you tried the irresponsible route. Uh Uh-uh. The punishment's going to fit the crime. You're going to have to be responsible for her now by supporting her and providing for the family. And second of all, you're going to have to do it in thorns. You're going to have to do it. And those are the two things. Remember, go back to what Fulton Sheen said. Suffering and responsibility. Those are the two things that God ultimately assigned to Adam, and that's the way that men grow up, is by doing things that require suffering and that require responsibility. This means that this, then, in relationship to men, that means that there's self-sacrifice in order to do, be responsible. You have to put yourself aside and do what's right. In relationship to the, um, the suffering part, you have to be willing to suffer to do what's right. So for a man to find his ultimate fulfillment as a man, not in the sense of a, as a human being and seeing God face to face, But as a man, he has to master himself to the point where when he does things that are hard and he takes responsibility and does the right kind of a job, there is the delight that comes from virtue, not pleasure, but virtue. Because the saints always say, and St. Thomas and Aristotle all the way along say, we get a certain delight out of performing acts of virtue. So he has to achieve that. To where someone asks him to do something difficult, okay, he just goes, does it. He doesn't sit there, nah, 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 nah. right, sitting there talking or doing whatever. In fact, sometimes guys spend more energy trying to get out of work than if they would just do it. All right. The fact that God told Adam he had to wear it by the sweat of his brow, okay, that means you have to embrace what is painful to achieve what is good. Self-love is effeminate because we get a pleasure out of loving ourselves, and man has a man, a real man has to put that aside. This is all. This is uh, all the. Uh, this is one of the reasons why only men, actually, are to be priests. Because they're called to that self-sacrifice to do what is arduous and more difficult, more so than women. You know, most people don't know this, but when you look at the cross, you are looking at the exact inversion of the fall of Adam and Eve. By exact, I mean exact. Adam did not deny himself the pleasure of eating the fruit, and so now he has to work in thorns. Christ is crowned with thorns, so Christ assumes that. Second, the maniple at Mass, which of course they've just discarded completely in the new rite, actually referred to work. It used to be a handkerchief that they would wipe the sweat and doing liturgical work. Liturgy literally means work. So that uh, Christ, when he hung upon the cross, he had to carry the cross, and that's why there was the sweat and blood in his face that they talk about when um, St. Veronica wiped his face. That's what it means to be a man. Christ is obviously the ultimate man because of the fact that he embraced exactly what builds masculinity and is the reflection of masculinity. But he put himself aside in his human nature in order to achieve what he needed for our salvation. But this is why priests are supposed to be men. Women aren't called to that same kind of a thing. This is why men are called to, to work in the workforce. Normally speaking, women aren't. I mean, they can work. Sometimes they have to work. But the second thing is this is one of the reasons why men are called to war because of the fact that it's hard, arduous work. My dad one time said, he said, you know what the problem is in the priesthood today? This is just. This is about two years before I was going to get ordained, and I and uh, I just wanted to hear what he said. I said, "No, what, what? What do you think it is?" He says, "There's no more men left in it." You see this all the time with priests. They'll sit there and they'll tell people in confession, "Oh, you don't need to confess that. Don't come to confession unless you have something mortal." Because why? They're lazy and they don't want to work. Or you'll see the priests don't want to toe the line in relationship to doctrinal teaching because of the fact that they know they're going to have to suffer in the process of doing that. And this is one of the signs that we've got a big problem on our hands. Pornography is obviously all four forms of effeminacy. 
intellectual because of the delight that one gets out of seeing something new, the volitional because you're choosing this to pursue the pleasure, the sensual, and then the appetitive that all goes along with it. Therefore, we reach a point of conference, okay, so what does this end? What is this guy supposed to look like? What does it mean to raise a man? First, so we have to know what the end is. This is what a man is. The second one is, this is how you get there. The end. Given what we said above, these are the traits of a true man. One, self-sacrifice, especially in relationship to his wife and his children. I tell guys, this is the moral of the story. And I tell women this too. Uh, I tell women, I'll first talk it from the, the women's side. I tell them, if, you, if you're dating some guy who's basically wanting to violate the Sixth Commandment with you, get away from him because he's effeminate. If he can't control himself in relationship to you now, he is not going to do it after you're married. It's going to get worse. Second, I tell the guys, you know, your job, is a, because part of the men is to engage in things that are hard and difficult, that's one of the reasons why our bodies are constitutively different. You know, I find it funny now that even though we went through 30 years of men and women are the same, they're the same, the same, now they're like, well, maybe they are a little different. You know, and by the way, we did these brain studies and found out their brains are different. Oh, really? You had to do a formal study to find that out. <laughs> All right. So, but what I tell guys is, is your job is to sacrifice yourself for her. And that means that the first, and that means you have to provide and protect for her, not just spiritually, but, or not just physically, but spiritually. But the primary person you have to protect her from is yourself. Because she's more likely to suffer injury at your expense than anyone else's because she loves you. So a man has to be self-sacrificial in relationship to his wife and his children. Any guy who doesn't master chastity, whether in or outside of marriage, is no man. A true man never counts the cost in terms of pain, but in proportion to the means to the end. In other words, he doesn't look and like, oh man, that's going to really hurt. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says, okay, what do I have to do to get this thing done? P putting the difficulty aside, I need to achieve the good for my family, for my children, my wife, etc. Okay, so self-sacrifice. Second, he has to be a man of virtue. First, he has to be a man of temperance. If he cannot put aside the pleasures of food and drink and women, he is no man. He's only thinking of himself. He's just selfish. This is one of the reasons why, you know, when they sit there and say, oh, he's a real man because he's sleeping with all those women. No, he's not. He's effeminate because he won't put aside his pleasure to protect these women from him. This is effeminate because women, uh, because women were designed, uh, oh, so if he thinks about himself all the time, this is effeminate because he wasn't designed that way. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed, the boys that are growing up today, are miserable, miserable. You look at them and they don't, they don't have any semblance of masculinity and they are absolutely miserable. <clears throat> and I think it's because of the fact that from the time that they're little, they're basically their masculinity is being beat out of them. Well, we have natural inclinations. God designed us this way and if you act contrary to nature, it's gonna dysfunction and you're gonna be miserable. But here, when a guy is constantly thinking about himself, it's effeminate because of the fact that that's the dynamic that God placed in women, not men. Why did God place that in women, where women think about themselves more than... than that? And ironically, now women are thinking more about other people than, than the men are. And it has to do with this. When a woman... And we see this actually playing itself in the context of Adam and Eve. God created in Eve an inclination when she, it says he, he led her, Eve, to Adam. And that leading meant that God placed in Eve the inclinations to, to, to be judged suitably, to be judged suitable to Adam. But that meant that she had to be concerned about that she, she, that she has the proper appearance, not fake, not fake appearance, but real appearance, that he's suitable, that I'm suitable to him. Okay, so that meant that women are kind of designed that way to be more concerned about their parents. Second, a woman, because of the nature of childbearing, has to have the husband support her so she can take proper care of the children. That being the case, that means that she has to look for a guy that's going to take care of her, not for her sake, but for the sake of the children. And that's where the real difference lies. A real woman 
looks at it for the sake of the children and not for her own. A fallen woman looks at it from her own point of view. So that designing, because the woman is kind of the pivot in the family. The, you know, the husband, he leaves his wife to go to work and he comes back. The children stay with the wife, generally speaking. And so she's the one to whom the, there's a kind of a fixity as to where they're going to be, etc. Where she is, that's where the home is. I mean, you hear that constantly, or you see that even in, in plaques. But that's why women are more concerned about themselves to some degree. Now, that obviously can go to, to extremes. When men do that, it's effeminate, because that's not the way they were designed. They were designed to put themselves aside. Next, he must have fortitude. A true man finds doing difficult things fulfilling. He likes doing them. Now, it doesn't mean that he's, that's the only thing he does. It's left that's hard and difficult and burns himself out. But we're just saying that, you know, a hard day's work, when he gets done, he likes the feel of being physically exhausted from it. Because it was what he was designed to do. By nature, men should excel more in fortitude, women in temperance. Especially chastity and modesty in relationship to women. Although, what, here's the irony of it. Men's excelling in chastity is less so for themselves and more so for women. For women, chastity is more about themselves because if they're not chaste, they could end up pregnant. Whereas for a guy, if he's not chaste, he can end up getting someone else pregnant. So it's not so much about him anymore. So that being the case, he has to look at chastity and those things from the point of view of guarding the integrity and the spiritual and psychological and physical well-being of women. That's how he has to view it. He has to have be a man of justice, here again sacrifice, but also the virtue of religion. Nothing drives me absolutely more nuts than when you get some guy saying, oh, you know, praying is women's stuff. Yeah, right. That's just your way of being effeminate. You know, I'm taking the mask around, I'm not going to go stand outside and have a smoke while everyone's in at mass. There are certain cultures that do that, and I'm like, yeah. If I was a priest, I'd stand out there, I'd first mass start, I'd say, every one of you guys that's not effeminate, get in here right now and start your praying. Why? Because praying is hard. The matters of religion are hard. That's why they're masculine. In fact, you know there's a, there, it's a disaster when in the church all the matters of religion are being ceded to women. That's a problem. It's a sign that masculinity has collapsed among the clergy. So, a guy who does not pray or tend to God above all is effeminate. The idea that the role of women, um, that that's the role of women, that's just an excuse. He has to maintain, his, in relationship to justice, he has to maintain authority in the home and does not cave to effeminacy in relationship to his wife, who wants to usurp his authority due to the way Eve handled the problem. That's the real problem that women have when they try and control. It's the sin of usurpation. They want to usurp the authority that's proper to Adam. He has to maintain that, but at the same time, he has to do it in a matter of equim equanimity. In other words, it can't, he has to do it in justice. He can't do it just to hold her down and get some satisfaction out of it, because then it's about himself, which again is effeminate. It's not about, it should be about her well-being and theirs. He does not, as a matter of justice to his children and wife, to maintain right order and therefore peace in the home. He does not pursue peace at the expense of his authority. Peace brings a certain pleasure. And so if you're, if you're not careful, I mean, he has to seek the tranquility of order. He has to establish right order, and as a result, peace will occur in the home. But he, that can't be his end. He has to, his end has to be what is spiritually best for everybody involved. A true man knows that authority is for those under him and not for himself. That's the whole structure. The structure of authority has absolutely nothing to do with the person who has it. It has to do with the protection and providence for those under him. This is a major problem in the traditional movement. Because men who are kind of rediscovering what's well, supposed to be the authority, because they have no virtue, and because many of them are effeminate, they have no ability to exercise authority in a balanced manner. So how does that come? Well, the way it comes is, is we'll see this, you have to first raise the men up, raise real men, and then they'll just have that balance on their own. But if you don't raise real men, you're not going to have that. Your wife and children are not there to serve you. 
And one of the things I hear from time to time, guys like, oh, changing diapers, that's women's work. Oh, really? According to the Fathers of the Church in St. Thomas Aquinas, the husband is responsible for everything in the family. Everything. Everything from washing the dishes to the support of the family down to the actual changing of the diapers of the kid. It's his responsibility. Now, God gave him a helper, that's what scripture says, not a slave, a helper who's there to help him accomplish what he is responsible for. That's his wife. She's not your slave, she's just there to help you do your job. Okay. Now, it's true that God naturally delegates to women by giving them certain perfections so that it's, you know, for, for some reason or another, women can do a lot of things much more easily or much more habitually than men, generally speaking. We're talking generally. But um, the guy who says, oh, that's women's, but, you know, it's, again, it's effeminate. I don't, I, really, what it boils down to is he doesn't want to deal with the smell of the diaper. I'm like, really, it's on that level? So, and a lot of times they hang it on, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be considered effeminate. And part of it is, is because not knowing right order, the feminist movement basically said you have to make your husband start doing all the work, which is not true, too. Prudence, he must have prudence. Men should excel at this. What is prudence? Prudence is the application of universal moral principles in the concrete. That's what prudence is. The virtue in your intellect by which you do that. So I have a universal principle. Thou shalt not steal. This is a case of stealing. Okay, prudence says don't take it in this particular case. Men should excel at this. Why? This cogitative power that has ability to make associations in our brain, this power performs three functions. One, it just makes associations. You do this with dogs. Even dogs have, a, have a, something similar to a cogitative power, but you do this with human beings. In fact, the, the entire... Uh, um, advertisement industry is based upon this association issue, right? You know, so what do you do? You get the beer product up there. Well, that may not be enough to sell the guy I'm buying it. So you put this really scantily clad woman next to it, and that will entice him, right? Because you associate the two. If you drink this beer, this is what you'll get. Yeah, what you're going to get is a bigger headache. <laughs> okay. So whereas, so with prudence, it's applying it in the concrete. The second thing the cogitative power does is it makes an assessment about whether something is good or bad just on a purely physical level. So if someone's bashing your hand, your cogitative power starts saying, okay, this isn't good, but before you even have a chance to make a judgment about it. The third is it prepares your images for abstract thinking. Women are designed more for the second operation of the cogitative power than the third. And by that we mean that women have a, a better grasp and ability to size things up on a sensory level when they're good or bad. That's called women's intuition. But it also is there because, remember when I said it's, you know, you're getting, it assesses whether something's good or bad. Out of that assessment can arise your emotions. And so women are designed more for that because of their, their emotional life is meant to help children. Men, on the other hand, are designed more for abstract thought. So when a guy is doing these, uh, these you know, following his emotions, he's actually short-circuiting that ability to think clearly. That's what I was talking about in the past. So why is, this, why is this important in relationship to prudence? In order to apply something in the concrete, I need not just the general principle of stealing is theft, right? Or theft is immoral. I also need to know this particular instance is a case of theft. So, I have to have the right images in my mind by which I judge what the concrete situation actually is. So, if I see something and I don't have all the imagery necessary or the, what the information necessary in my images in order to judge that this is an act of theft, if I take this, then I'll end up do, I could end up doing something that's not right. Okay, here's the problem. The emotions, when you have an emotion, it gets merged with this image in your imagination upon which you judge matters, and so emotions compromise your intellectual judgment. So the more a man thinks according to his emotions, the more compromised is his judgment going to be about particular things. Because it's in the image that these particular things, the abstract things, are in a different part of the intellect. So. When he goes to be prudent, when he's trying to apply this in the concrete, if he's following his emotions, he's never going to be prudent because he's never going to be able to apply the, con the universal principle concretely in the right way. This is why most trad guys are just all over the map when it comes to knowing how to exercise proper authority in their home because it's all an emotion. 
rather than reason, hard reason. This is the best thing. We've got to stick to it. Men should excel in prudence, but instead they're not. He has to be the one who can do, look at, to judge what is objectively what is good and then do it. If he can't do that, regardless of how he feels, if a man looks at something and he can't even clearly judge what the right thing is to do, his masculinity has already been compromised. This is one of the reasons why this all-out assault on masculinity in our culture is causing men to just act ridiculously. The second part of it, though, is, is that the, um, if, he, if he does know the right thing, but his emotions get in there and it starts affecting his judgment, and then he ends up choosing to follow his emotion, he's no man. Because the man is the guy who th thinks according to this third act of the cogitative power, abstractly or objectively, and then sees what's right and wrong, and then he pursues it. And it doesn't matter how painful or how difficult, that's what he does. Next, he should have meekness. Meekness is the virtue opposite of anger. The guy who's angry is the guy who's effeminate. How do you know that? Because a lot of times, you know, you get these guys that are big, they're really mean, and you're just like, ah, oh, it's just effeminacy. And the reason you know that, well, one, because Christ said, learn from me, for I'm meek and humble of heart. Well, if he's the ideal man, well, then, okay, we have to assess things here. But the first part, but basically what it is, is anger is a complex passion in which there's a perception of injury with a desire for vindication. Now, the desire for vindication, when you vindicate, and what St. Thomas says, what's vindication? It's where you harm the other person or thing so that it stops harming you. And when you do that, you get a pleasure out of it. There's your effeminacy part. But there's another hidden form of feminacy, and that is the perception of injury. A real man can take blows, they say, the philosophers say, he can take the blows and still keep standing, right? In other words, the guy who, regardless of what happens in the family or with his wife or in the situation, his work or what have you, or driving down the road for that matter, considering that, as I said in one of my, com in one of my homilies, that if you're, getting, if you're gonna get behind a wheel, you have to recognize you just stepped into a sphere of idiots. Because, and by the way, you're one of the idiots that's driving out there, right? Okay, so, but the point is, is that if he can't take the, if he can't take the needling, and he just goes to seek the vindication, that's a sign of a feminist, whereas a real man can just stand there and take the needling. Because it's painful, yeah, but I can deal with that. I'm not worried about that. I'm just concerned about what's best for my wife's spiritual well-being or this particular child. I'm not interested in whether I get to meet out this and get that satisfaction from it. Humility. Obviously, humility is a truly masculine virtue. And here we're not talking about you know, the self-deprecating guy who just walks around and cowers. That's what we're talking about. That's against fortitude. What we're talking about in humility is, the definition of humility is a willingness to lead a life in accordance with the truth and not judging yourself greater than you are. Why is that? Why is pride effeminate? Pride is effeminate because of the fact that in pride we get a pleasure out of thinking about our own excellence, St. Thomas says. And so it's effeminate because the person just kind of like takes delight in his own greatness, right? When he's not, usually. So the truly humble man is the man that embraces his defects, embraces what his problems are, and looks at it and says, this is what I am, you know? And that's painful, it's hard, it's difficult, it requires interior self-discipline and self-control. In fact, it's the hardest virtue, I think, especially for men. In the end, he should have all of the virtues. So that's what a man's supposed to look like. The guy who not just physically, but morally, spiritually, can to remain steadfast, has that interior self-discipline, self-control, and remain steadfast in what is right, regardless of the pain or the pleasure involved. So what's the means? Well, Fulton Sheen, again, describes it, pain and responsibility. So, this means that if you're going to make, raise a man, the first thing you have to do is, especially if you're a, a mother, is you have to be willing to let your boy suffer a bit. And here I'm not talking about disordered suffering. I'm talking about ordered suffering. Today, boys have no responsibility either. There's no consequences for even when they do something wrong. You know, recently, one of my relatives, this, 
you know, 18 year old boy goes ripping on the, in his dad's new Camaro, plows into my relative, and then he just goes home. The dad buys him a new car, and then they think it's over with. No. He should have to go to work and have to pay, pay compensation for this. <coughs> Instead, what did they do? Well, we'll send him to this one school so he can be reformed. It wasn't even a school. It was a place where he got to go and hang out and have a vacation for six weeks. They have no suffering. And boys, again, today are constantly feeding that pleasure, their appetites, and the fathers as well. So suffering and pain. What's the difference between suffering and pain? Animals have pain. They do not suffer. Human beings have both suffering and pain. Suffering or pain is when you physically feel something bad that's, that's affecting you, whether it's physical or emotional or intellectual, etc. Suffering is when it goes on for a while. And when it goes on for a while, it involves a judgment of time. That's why animals don't have suffering, because they don't understand time. I mean, animals, when they're sitting in the lab getting poked with stuff, they don't sit there, hey, you know, this thing has been here bothering me for six hours. Could you get rid of it? They don't say that, right? Whereas human beings, after a while, they say, okay, I'm tired of this. This means that boys must work in things that are physically, emotionally, mentally, and volitionally difficult. They must be required to encounter things that are physically difficult to do, emotionally, where they have to put the, their emotions aside, mentally, and volitionally. They must put, be put in situations where they are consistently engaged what is hard to do to build self-denial in every level. It has to be a consistent thing that they have to come up against. Now, by consistent, I don't mean constant. In other words, if a guy is really going to become a man, he has to be someone who is, is giving, given the age, because it's also based on age. You don't make some kid who's five years old go out and, t and till the yard, right? But you might tell him, okay, put your toys up, do these things, and, and, and then, but once, he's, once he goes through puberty, he has to start doing hard physical work. He has to start doing things that are difficult, and he has to be doing them consistently. And by consistently, I mean not just one hour a month. That isn't going to be good enough because the rest of the time he's going to be feeding his pleasure and all he's going to be thinking about is when is this hour going to get over with. Instead, it should be an hour to two hours every day or every other day. I mean, it should be stuff that's hard, it's difficult, and it's something to do. It's stuff that he has to engage in that's difficult. If it is inconsistent, again, he will not learn to work hard but to figure out how to avoid hard work. They must be shown the value of that hard work and what they achieve through that. So two, there's two sides to that. One is he should get some kind of a remuneration in some sense, if possible, that he should you know, go out and work and do this so that you can actually, you know, and then you give him the 50 cents an hour or whatever you want to give him. But you make him do the hard work and so then when he gets the thing, he realizes, okay, this has a good end. But the second part of it is he has, he has to be encouraged. Hey, you did a good job, that was hard work, I'm proud of you, you know. Um, etc. so that he recognized that there's that affirmation of this is a good thing. This is um, one of the reasons why giving your son everything he wants without making him earn it is bad practice. It's imprudent because what's going to happen is, is he's never going to learn what it really means to be a man by doing things that are hard and difficult. He must be taught by example. If the father is absent or effeminate, it will be very difficult for the boy to become a man because he will learn, because we learn through seeing. Usually one of two things will happen. The guy will just become effeminate like his father, or what he will do is he will go to the opposite extreme and pursue effeminacy in a different form, like getting the joy out of beating other boys up or things like that. In fact, remember when I said that, you know, you want to kind of slap him around and man him up a bit? That's the suffering side of it. You want to make him suffer a little bit so that he has to deal with it so that he can put his pleasure aside and actually become more masculine, maybe actually matures. The work must be moderated according to age and condition of the son so as not to be too much, but also not to be too little. He must also see the father practice the theological virtues, especially prayer, so that he learns that being a real man includes rendering to God his due and not just indulging himself. You know, while the mother is sitting in there praying on the, in, in, her, in her room and he's out there watching TV drinking beer, although I like watching TV and drinking beer myself, that's not the point. Okay. He must learn meekness. 
When things do not go his way, he must learn to moderate his anger. When I grew up, if something didn't go quite your way, if you blew your lid, you got your fanny fanned as a result of it. And it was basically, hey, you know, grow up. This is just life here. He must learn humility in all matters. Technology must be kept to a minimum that is used only for what is necessary as a general rule. He must see technology as a tool and not a toy that is a means of accomplishing those things for uh, those things for those under him rather than for his own indulgence. Having him exercise virtue and self-restraint in these areas and rewarding that will help him to moderate himself. In other words, when there's first when you're first moderating it, you kind of got parents have to do it, but at a certain stage, he has to get on the honor system where he's the one moderating it for his own sake. Recreation must be seen as a means and not an end. Aristotle says that we engage in recreation for the pleasure's sake, and he says, why pleasure? Because he says pleasure, and St. Thomas picks this up, because pleasure recreates the soul when it's done moderately. If it's done immoderately, it causes the soul to dissipate, they say, which is true. Mothers must avoid the tendency not to want to see their boys suffer. Women are, and then there's the other side of it, is women are actively trying to destroy masculinity. Feminism, by the way, is ultimately just self-hatred. Most women who are feminists say, I'm fighting for the rights of women. No, you're not. You're fighting to make yourself feel better about the fact that you're a woman. Two things. One, being a woman is a perfection. Just as being a man is a perfection. So you shouldn't have to feel bad about being a woman. In fact, being a woman is a great thing. Second, that in destroying the masculinity, all you, okay, so that's what they try and do. I mean, basically what feminism does is it wants the reminder of who they are as women by virtue of the fact that there's a man standing in front of them. And so what that really is, is it's that self-hatred, that self-loathing that they have in relationship to this. And how do you know this? I deal with people like this all the time. You can see this. Even women who, women who are really feminine take real delight in seeing a guy who's a real man. Whereas the feminist, and the, I mean by real women, I mean in the sense that they have the self-possession and self-control too, and they, they're, you know, they're very virtuous, etc. And it's, they, they just love true masculinity. Whereas women who are feminists are miserable. Every one of them who says, oh, you know, uh, if they, it's, it, it's, it's very similar to another problem in our culture. There's another problem in our culture that's very similar to this. It says, if everybody would just approve of me, then I would feel fine about my condition. No, you will not. Because the problem is endemic to you. It has nothing to do with those things externally. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I, I, this does not mean that women ha don't, shouldn't be treated with the proper dignity that's true to them, and both in their human nature and their profession as women. The real problem with femininity, or, me or feminism, not femininity, feminiz feminism is, it wants to ultimately destroy feminine, what is feminine. And that's sad, because what's feminine is beautiful. Not just physically, but psychologically and morally, etc. That's the sad part of it. So one of the things they have to do is they have to emasculate men so they don't feel so bad about themselves. Okay, so suffering. Men have to be willing to suffer. Women have to let men become men. And that means letting their boys suffer. You know, guys will take the boy. And by the way, we're going to wind down here in about, I'll just got a little bit more, so bear with me. Guys kind of wait for the day when which they can take little Johnny, who's four years old, right? Okay, Johnny, we're going to go to the boxing ring. I'm going to put these boxing gloves on you. Of course, they're so big, you couldn't wield them with much force, right? And you put him in with some other guy. So, and then they say, okay, guys, you know, whoever, whoever hits the guy on the chest the most wins, right? And so they'll just, you see the little kids trying to beat each other, right? And the guys are like, that's it, that's my boy, right? And the reason being is, is because in that process, the, the kid learns, okay, I can take a bit of a beating and still stay standing, and not have to flee the situation. Obviously, this has to be moderated. I'm not suggesting, by the way, you put your kids in boxing rings. But what I'm suggesting is, is that women have to let their boys be men. Responsibility, that's the next means. The boy must see the father not capitulate his authority in the family, because as soon as he sees that, he'll learn that the path is the easy way, the way of pleasure. He must also see his father exercise authority responsibly. 
because if he doesn't see his, uh, his, he'll grow to hate masculinity because he'll see that the injustice is being done against his mother. Not always, by the way, uh, in the sense of he may not always grow to hate masculinity, but he's going to grow to have that impiety in relationship to his father. And you see his father showing that his authority is for the... And when he sees his father exercising it properly, you see that, hey, my dad's a real man because he's doing this for the sake of everybody else, not for himself. He must see his father show true love for his mother and a willingness to sacrifice for her and her children. He must, according to age and abilities, be put in charge of things and be held responsible if they do not work out properly to the degree that he is responsible. Put him in charge of it. If he doesn't do it, then you have to fear a proportionate punishment. And so that he learns, this is, this is life. This is the way men have to grow in masculinity. He must see the fruit of his labor, as I mentioned, making him work nonstop without any reward or remuneration or benefit, according to time and place, will make him feel that he's just a slave and in a concentration camp. On the other hand, if you don't make him work, he's going to think that everybody's really there to serve his needs. This is the real problem with the generation today. Everybody's complaining that the generation today, they want a big fat paycheck, they don't want to have to work for it, and yet they, don't, and yet they still want to, and, and, and everybody owes them something. Well, where do you think this came from? It came from the fact that we basically told boys, you know, you deserve this, you owe this, they brought you into this life, therefore they owe you something. No, they don't. You know, your parents only owe you one thing, to get you to the age of majority in spiritual and physical intactness. That's all their obligation is. He must be taught to appropriate those things under his charge, and by appropriate we mean take care of them, want to take care of them, those things under him that he's put in response, put in charge of, so that when he does it, he takes a joy in seeing that, they're, that they flourish, those things flourish. Because then when he becomes married, he'll take joy in seeing his wife and his family flourish. He sees the value of his contribution to the good of the family, even if he, even if he doesn't necessarily get the total amount of his paycheck that he's working for when he's growing up, at least he sees that the family is getting the good from it. He must learn right order and authority structure by observing the mom submit to the husband and his father loving his wife for her submission. But also he goes through the, as he goes through the teenage years to learn docility and prudence by following right order. This is one of the real problems in relationship to homeschooling. Because there comes a certain stage in the homeschooling process where the boys get to this point where they've gone through period, they're 15, 16 years of age, and they don't think they should be under mother. Guess what? There's a little problem. It's called the fourth commandment. So you're going to be stuck with that for the rest of your life. A true man, and this is one of the things that uh, that boys have to learn, a true man submits to his mother because it's hard and because it makes you be a man of virtue, and specifically the virtue of piety, in which we give honor to those who are above us. I've never met a guy that I thought was really masculine that did not have a true love and appreciation for his parents and didn't want to do right by them. And that has to be fostered. So in, in terms of the homeschooling, they're like, well, we need some way to help him. Well, here's the way you make him man up. The father comes in and says, you're going to obey your mother as a man of being a man. That's what it comes down to. Now, on the other hand, the mother cannot treat him like a 10-year-old anymore, which is a tendency that sometimes you see, because in the end, he's just going to rebel. If she sees that he's asking him to do stuff that's prudent and necessary, then he, and he does it, if he sees that that's what she's asking, then he'll actually appreciate actually doing things for his mother, and he'll grow to love her and want to do things to please her. A real man desires from the virtue, he gets delight from the virtue of piety in pleasing his parents. This is one of the real problems with teenage boys. Is a lot of times they just want to be on their own. Well, the way you're on your own is first and foremost conquering yourself interiorly, not externally. Because you're not going to have freedom externally for a while. And even when you get married, then there goes a lot of your freedom. And then you get a job, there goes even more. So the moral of the story is, is that you have to have that interior self-discipline and self-control. That's where your freedom is going to lie because you're going to be freed from the compulsion of doing things that you know are wrong. For him, not to, uh, for him to want to do his own thing and think he knows it all is a sign of mental effeminacy. Man up, buddy. Submit to your mother as part of the Ten Commandments. That's what, you have to, that's what he has to do. 
So how do you make a, man, a boy into a man? You develop virtue. That's what it's really all about. He has to be taught what the virtues are and how to obtain them and how to take delight in them. Not pleasure, delight. In knowing, I'm, okay, I'm doing what's the right thing and I'm going to remain steadfast in that. He must have, the, so when you, the goal is to get him to the age of 18 in which he has all the moral and proper mental habits, the moral and mental habits of seeing things properly, making sure that his judgment is not affected by his emotion, and that his intellect judges matter illumined by faith rather than his emotions. That's the goal. And you're not going to attain that unless he doesn't have, unless he does have some degree of responsibility and suffering. It's just part of it. 